Hey, Julia. So you'll have to take yourself off mute once we get going. Okay. Um, so this is our sensory Q&A call. Uh, thanks to those of you who are joining us live. And for the rest of you, you can watch this later. But um, Julia McCowan is here. Hi, Julia. Um, <laughs> and you saw her in the uh, sensory and oral motor 101 uh, workshop videos. I hope that was helpful for you. And we are going to tackle the questions that were presented on the Facebook group. And, um, but if you have any others, feel free to jump in for those that are joining live. And otherwise, if you're watching this after the fact, then feel free to post them in the group and just tag Julia. So, um, we're going to start with Alina's and, um, so did you have that Julia or did you want me to pull it up? Maybe I don't, oh, okay. I'm seeing it now. Encouraging okay. chewing things other than bread and pasta. That one? Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's see here. She says, um, yeah, that's the one. Okay, so Alina, you were wondering, so you said the main issue for us is encouraging chewing of things other than bread and pasta. So that was the first thing. Um, so Alina, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Do you mean that um, he's chewing mushy textures? Because bread and pasta are pretty soft. I think so. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Haven't done this before. Um, yeah, so I, I don't even know if it's mushy. I don't know what it is that he likes about it, but he definitely loves things that are very soupy. Like he loves soup. Um, rice may be a little bit dry, but if I put rice in a broth, he'll eat it. Or like even vegetables, as long as they're in a broth, they're, he's okay. okay. But when it's something that's dry, even though I think bread is dry, he he's okay. Like he loves pita. Okay. Pita or, you know, occasionally he'll eat pizza. But I guess... He just gets tired when he eats dry foods, and then he ends up drinking a lot. And I think he just gets really full on all of that, and he doesn't want to eat anymore. And I know he's starving. Like by his behavior, I know he's starving. Right. So if you feed him, and he'll sit there and eat for an hour and a half, he'll be full. Okay. Um, okay. So it, it. I mean, from what I'm hearing, just a little tiny snapshot, it does sound like he has an easier time chewing those mushier things. So the, the you know, bread and pasta um, and wet food, like as you would describe it, soupy things, that requires a lot less um, of your muscles, right? So that requires a lot less um, of the muscles around your mouth and your jaw. Um, so it's possible without me seeing him, it's really hard for me to judge something like that without having my eyes on him. But sometimes um, that's an issue of strength and oral motor skills as opposed to necessarily sensory. Um, it would be hard for me to judge without really seeing him. It's possible that from a sensory perspective, he is preferring those kind of soft, soupy textures, whereas the more crunchy textures, he doesn't like the feeling of them in his mouth or the wet or sorry, the dry textures, um, definitely possible. Did, did anything come up on your sensory checklist? Um, I looked at it and I didn't, not really actually. Okay. Nothing really jumped out at you for seeking or avoiding or anything? No, not, not, not really to be honest. Okay. No. I'm just so I, the rest of yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, I don't, like I, other than the taste and smell stuff, right? Okay. So, like eating new foods, eating familiar foods, eating strongly flavored foods. Like he won't even touch that. He won't touch strongly won't. flavored? Sorry? You said he won't touch strongly flavored food? No. Okay. If he doesn't like the smell, he won't. But I, I, I think that's not even, that's not the main issue for us. I think for us it's the chewing and the swallowing. If something is dry, he won't swallow it. He will sit with it. Like he will have a piece of chicken in his mouth for 20 minutes. And he will take care with him. Uh, but can I actually just ask a question, Alina? How old is your son again? He's four. He's four. Okay. Um, and has this been going on for a while or? Yeah. 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 Well, before we kind of said that, it, you know, we didn't think that it's a big deal, but now he's four. Like, clearly it's an issue. Yeah. Because I, you know, I just from personal um, experience in sensory and oral motor is, you know, um, Julie definitely is the expert in this area, but I just wanted to voice that with my eldest, um, my first child, she did the same thing, the whole chipmunk effect. And um, Julie, would you say that's more like tongue lateral, it could be tongue lateralized lateralization or like low, I think you were saying like low muscle tone. So to your point, like it's not sensory so much, but more, um, yeah, more of just like the, 
being able to move the, the, I guess, motor skills within the mouth? Definitely could be. It's really like, that's something that's hard to piece out without really seeing what yeah. a kid is doing, like without really having eyes on somebody. That's one piece that's hard because it could for sure, like exactly what you're saying, especially with the chipmunk, like with um, pocketing and whatnot. Sometimes it is more related to sensory issues and sometimes it's more related to oral motor issues. And a lot of the time the two are intertwined. So a lot of the time, if kids are having issues with, with um, sensory issues, then we might see some oral motor developmental things in there as well. Um, so it definitely could be a combination of the two, but it does, it sounds like if he's doing a lot, a lot, a lot of chewing, then he's needing to do more work um, to swallow those, or to, you know, to really break down and swallow those harder textures like meat is a bit of a harder texture it takes a lot more movement of the tongue and of the cheeks it takes a, like a more of what we call a rotary chew so moving that tongue and everything around um and that is a harder skill um so i actually think like. it's probably not even the chewing it's the swallowing it's the swallow. more of an issue so that's why i'm wondering is it a sensory thing or is it an oral thing because he already has it it's chewed up mm -hmm. why not just swallow it yeah it's it, Definitely, if there's there, there could definitely be something oral motor going on, and swallowing is part of that, right? So swallowing is part of all the muscles and and the kind of mechanisms of what's happening around the mouth. So, um, could definitely be something bigger going on, um, more than just sensory. I saw you. You also wrote that he has trouble sitting at the table. Yeah, he's just he's very he 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 prefers to like he would literally go and put himself in a time <laughs> He would just say, okay, I'm going to go sit in time out, <laughs> then, then sit and eat. And he has two other sisters. They have no issues at all. Okay. And that could be a combination of lots of different things. Um, again, it, that one, it, I mean, the for sure with, um, with what you're describing, I would probably want to see him in order to piece out what's going on from an oral motor versus a sensory perspective. But um, it might be worth having an assessment just to just to see if there's something a little bit more going on with the chewing and swallowing. I, I was actually wondering, are there exercises that he can do? Like, is there things that we can do to get him there? It's you know, I, and if it doesn't work, I'll definitely bring him in for an assessment. But I was thinking that because we did this, right? Like we did the pick eater protocol. So maybe there's just some exercises that we can do in addition to it. And, you know, maybe we'll see some progress. Um, it, there, it's possible. I, I'm hesitant to give something out to you without having my eyes on him, just because if there is something going on with the swallowing, it's tough to, you know, it's tough to say whether or not something would work that I would, that I would give you, I guess. Um, so it, I'm not sure just hearing this amount of information how much I can give you just in this kind of a format. And actually just that point, and I should just mention for, um, for Lena and for anyone else who listens on is um, even in my position, it's, it's, it's really tough without seeing a child eating to, to know. And I, also if a child um, could be hyposensitive or hyper and one strategy is for hyper being, you know, really sensitive to texture and one could be for, you know, being like having that lack of sense. So it, it, they can actually have the opposite effect, which you don't want to have. So that's why we're both kind of reluctant to give very specific advice. So one thing that might help Julia, and I don't know if you're open to this, open to this Julia, but um, if she were to post like a, a quick video of her son eating, um, if that would help a little bit, just to get, say, you know what? Yeah, there's something going on here. You should come in for a consult or, you know what, this is just a typical childhood behavior, right? If you could even assess from that point, um, if there were a quick video. So it would definitely sure, I'll, I'll do that. I really, I really don't think that it's anything severe. Um, because yeah. when I see him eating bread or pasta, like I, no issues at all. You know, he will eat no problem at all. Like no chewing issues, nothing. You give him a cookie, also no chewing issues. Then you give him something like meat that's fibrous, and I think he has issues like that. That that's where we see challenges. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be something severe, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't really severe for my daughter either, but eat um, either. But she refused like virtually. She really only had like three or four foods for a number and number of months just because she didn't know how to move, like she wasn't moving her tongue properly or um, there were certain textures that were throwing them off. And so if they feel that anxiety, it's um, he's not really, that's the thing. He's not really refusing it. Like I can't say that he's refusing stuff. Okay. And that's, well, that's a good sign. The fact that he's willing to put it in his mouth is a, mm -hmm. is a really good sign because um, he needs to be able to taste it. And sometimes honestly for us, 
uh, yeah, there were some, some activities that we had to try. Some worked, some didn't work as well. A lot of it's trial and error. And then um, the other is just kind of is, is uh, getting that practice, right? So I know he's four now. Um, at this point, I know, Julia, would you say like at four, they sh because he's a bit older or younger? Like, is that... It's honestly, like, again, it, it's tough to say, like, the more you describe it, I don't, because he's, you're telling me that he's kind of accepting it so willingly, like, he really is willing to try meat textures and some of those crunchy textures, it's just taking longer for him to swallow. I think, it, like, it doesn't sound overly sensory to me because if somebody was very very sensitive to what was going on with a certain type of texture over another it, they wouldn't be quite as accepting as as what you're describing to me um you could you could try like have you ever tried um like encouraging the swallow sooner rather than using water like just kind of prompting him to swallow no not really like he just asks for water himself Okay. Okay. That's water. his, but that's his strategy is to kind of sip water. Yeah. Have you ever tried counting the chews? Like saying no. like, let's count together. We're going to chew, you know, 10 times or 15 times or 20 times. No, I haven't done that. That's actually a really good idea. You can okay. try counting down. Like I would choose a high number because it sounds like he's chewing for a long time. So start with like even 25 chews, um, try to, try to meet him kind of close to where he's at. So if he's chewing, you know, if you're noticing that he's chewing something, how long did you say? Like how many minutes? Oh, something's, I think he's done chewing. He's just like, it's the chipmunk effect. Like Danielle was just saying. He's just holding so it. Like, yeah. Like he's done chewing, like he was chewing and chewing and chewing and then he's done chewing. And then he's sort of like, you know, he's got like this ball of fibers in his mouth and he's right. just trans transferring it from one side to another. So you can try, again, try meeting him sort of where he's at for the, maybe even like if you can watch him and count the number of chews he's doing or how long he's holding it there and mm -hmm. start there. So start with, for example, 25 chews and you can even do it with him. So put the chicken in your mouth or whatever you're giving him with him, count down. So start at 25 and count down from there. And then when you get and tell him, you know, we're going to count down our chews. And when we get to zero, we're going to swallow it together and Try, try that I'm just it's more like that's more just a behavioral strategy I'm just curious to know if he needs a little bit more preparation just to get to the swallow I think that actually may work so this is the kind of stuff yeah that's perfect like this is the kind of stuff that I was looking for that maybe there's just things that I can do to encourage him and, and there, then of course if none of that works I am more than open to bring him for an assessment but I just feel that you know because I did this yeah I, I should be able to get, you know, just some tips and pointers that I should try first before bringing him in for an assessment. That's all. Perfect. Yeah. Just like Danielle said, it's just with, with sometimes when it's um, concerns about the chewing or the swallowing or sensory, it's just a concern of giving that one piece of something that might go in the wrong direction. So that's where, because it's eating and it's swallowing, we just have to be somewhat cautious of, of safety. Um, that's the only reason I hesitate a little bit when it comes to swallowing. I, I don't think we're, I don't think there's safety issues okay. like on our end. It's, it's, it's not severe. He's four years old. It's, it's just, honestly, it's just more annoying than anything because I have three kids. And I don't have all the time in the world to sit and help him. Like, I need, you know, I need to take my other kids to classes and do homework and all sorts of stuff. And I feel like three hours a day are spent feeding this child. Um, yeah, and you know what? And that's the thing too. Sometimes you just have to cut the meal off. Like you shouldn't be sitting at the table for that long. As much as we want food, and I had the same issue, Alina. Um, and so I totally get it. You know, she was too with some of the stuff uh so a little bit younger but saints should have all of the oral motor skills at that point so two or four but um so a couple things is try to reduce and tell me if you disagree julia or if you have another viewpoint but try to limit that meal time because one it's just not enjoyable for you your stress levels rise the anxiety rises he senses it it just starts this negative spiral so if you can try to keep the meals like 40 minutes at most yeah. and just you know what okay you know what um the meal's done because you don't want to sit at the table all day especially with three kids I man i have third on the way there's no way <laughs> like, it's just it's um it's just too much i would say Try that, even if you just start with one meal and just start to reduce it that way if you don't feel comfortable um, reducing. Mm -hmm. and you, even if he walks around with the food in his mouth, so my daughter would do that, and then she would eventually swallow it, not even realizing it while she's playing. So maybe taking the mindset off of the swallowing might help. 
as well because he's sitting there eating and he's just thinking about, oh God, I got to chew. I got to, I mean, I have to swallow. I have to swallow. So there might be some anxiety around swallowing for one reason. He might've, I don't know if he had reflux as a baby or there could be so many reasons why a kid would be adverse, um, a child would be adverse or hold off on swallowing. The other thing is just the size of the food the smaller, the better. So if maybe giving, um, I like to do toothpicks as I suggested in phase four. So putting, if it's meat or foods that are more difficult for a child to chew, put them on the end of a toothpick, super tiny. Like that, really- that actually, yes, that tip works. That tip does work. If okay. we if do that, he, he does. Yeah. So continue with that, right? And then slowly you can increase the size, but I would keep working on that until he's super comfortable with, ch- with swallowing a certain size of food and then you increase it a little bit more. Um, the toothpick helps put it in the back molar. So if it, there is a, an oral motor issue that might uh, help with um, just getting the right placement because a lot of kids will put it in the front of their teeth and then they can't figure out where to move it, but he's already knows how to chew. He's just the swallowing piece. So the smaller, uh, the lower the anxiety. Um, so continue with that strategy for sure. And even if some kids tend to put, like my daughter would put just a whack load of food in her mouth. Um, and so if you can try to prevent that by just putting a little bit on this plate at a time to prevent, um, just this excess of food and then it goes down quicker. So it's like little bits, but it faster momentum or quicker momentum. Okay. So if you cut down the meal times, then how often do you have to feed them again? Same. Use the, use the same window, two and a half hours. Okay. Two hours, yeah. Um, something I've used in the past, I've used it more related to bite sizes, but it could be related to portion sizes. So we, I've used before just a little visual with different animals on it, and then that's the size of the bite that the child will take. So if they're taking a mouse bite, it might be a really teeny tiny bite. If they're taking a trick bite, it's a little bigger, and then you get to like an elephant bite. That's like a nice, you know, not too big, but a sizable bite, and that's for kids who are having trouble getting a good amount in in that meal time, like if they're taking a really long time to get the the meals in. So if the toothpicks are working for you, you can even portion out like five little toothpicks of meat and tell him like, so that's, you know, that if, if that's something that would encourage him, like um, he can choose the kind of animal that he's eating like. So how many bites would an elephant take? Maybe an elephant would take five bites. So, you know, one at a time, but just kind of encouraging that. So he's focused on how many bites am I going to do? Um, might help to speed it along a little bit, but I would definitely, I would cap a meal time at 30 to 60 minutes and it needs to, it needs to stay positive because then he's not, you know, that when we get away from that and everybody's getting frustrated, that just is going to propel those behaviors further for sure. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. I'll, I'll start cutting it off because we also have like a grandparents issue where they'll just feed him. Like after half an hour, there's a bunch of food and they know he's still hungry. So they'll feed him. Your grandparents, you so, know, they mean so well, but <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's where you just have to bring them in into the plan and say, hey, listen, you know, we're, we're investing in this and um, it's really important that we stick to the strategy. Um, one thing that they told us that we really, in order for us, what's your son's name again, Alina? Ryan. Ryan, yeah. So in order for him to see progress, it's really important that we do this. Um, so that means, you know, after, and, and some days it's okay. Like we can't, we can't, all this a hundred percent of the time. I totally get it. Like life gets in the way. And sometimes actually having just food laying on the table, freestyle can actually encourage a child to try new foods. So, um, just not to do it all the time because then they won't sit down and, and eat a meal properly. But I'd say just for your own sanity and for his, um, success to try and limit it. And I know it'll feel, um, uncomfortable for you to cut it off, but you can just give them that four warnings. So if you remember the three W's after a meal, okay, so we have five minutes left. You can even put on the timer if it's not anxiety provoking for him and, and say, um, we are, uh, yeah, the, you know, we're, let's put on the timer together and you can put it on your phone or in your oven, whatever. And just so he knows, and you'll get the sense of what five minutes looks like. So he's got that time to work on it. And, uh, yeah. And, and you can just say, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to spend all day. We love eating, but there's so many other fun things to do. So we don't want to spend all day at the table. Right. So you can just use that language just so he doesn't get upset about it. Yeah. Well, he certainly doesn't love eating. So, <laughs> so he'll be yeah. totally fine. he's totally fine with that. He doesn't love. Yeah. Um, Anyways, and, and again, if he knows he has to sit there for an hour and a half or an hour to like get, it's, of course, he's, he's going to dislike meals even more, <laughs> right, right. right? 
So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's so weird. He's never had interest in food as a baby. Like, just not interested. We went to see Dr. Newman, and Dr. Newman was like, yeah, take him to your restroom. Give him a piece of steak. Give him a piece of broccoli. And I was like, we've been doing that. The child does not care for steak, broccoli, nothing. Yeah, like, and, and you know what? As we know, and as you know, every child is so different. It's like shocking that they're the same, <laughs> like come from the same genetic makeup because I have the same thing. I've got the biggest foodie who will try anything. Um, she had arugula salad for dinner at the age of two. And then my other child too was like complete, you know, mess. so it's it, part of it is recognizing that they're all going to have their different personalities and the fact that you're doing all the right things and will continue to learn is, um, is really, it's, like that's the foundation of it. And it'll mm -hmm. take time, especially if, um, I think I remember from our, like he is a bit more of, um, from a personality perspective, would you say he's a more sensitive child or stubborn definitely, or? Definitely more sensitive, yeah. Yeah, so that's like that, can, it can be personality driven too, to Julia's, um, Julia's earlier point about behavioral. Like it's, uh, and so as long as you're putting in and you're using the right, approach and you're setting that foundation of here are the expectations. We're only at the table of 40 minutes. You're always going to have something there that you like. You don't have to eat it if you don't want to. And you're offering like you're giving him opportunities to be successful. Then you're doing everything right and he'll come through. It just will take longer than the average child. And so it's, it's, um, as hard as it is being patient is like one of the, they say patience is a virtue, especially when it comes to this kind of stuff as a parent as tough as it is, especially when you have three kids. Um, but you're definitely, you know, um, you're, you're doing the right things. That sounds good. I have another question about food chaining. So where do you go? Like, let's say from pasta, like how do you get from pasta to chicken other than, you know, the bite sized pieces? Is there, is there, you know, like a suggested food where you go next in terms of the textures to kind of make it easier for them? Um, so for food chain, Julie, did you want to, oh, sorry, I got someone calling at the same time. Um, did you want to tell me, do you want to just tell me what you know so far? Like just Danielle, I'm not sure where you've gone with the food chaining. Yeah. We've just talked about, um, the, so looking at foods from a sensory perspective yeah. that, in, uh, introducing foods that are similar. So if they like crackers, then choose a different brand of crackers, right. then choose a cheesy cracker, then choose. And so kind of using that extension, uh, for preferred foods. Okay. Yeah. Pasta to chicken is a tough one. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, I was, I didn't know here what the last yeah. one was. I thought I heard chicken. Yeah. No. <laughs> no yeah. But like eventually. So we tried different kinds of pasta, right? We yeah. were, you know, we tried normal pasta. We've tried all sorts of gluten-free pasta, you know, the, I've been trying to push the chickpea and the lentil one so far. It's, it's a total fail. And he doesn't like tomato sauce, so I can't cover stuff in the sauce for him to actually eat it. So this has been a bit of a challenge for us. You said he likes soupy things. So what, what kinds of things does he like that are wet? Like what are the wet, the wet textures he likes? Oh, so like anything inside a soup. Anything, just anything inside a soup. Like what happens if you put meat inside a soup like chicken? Yeah, yeah I, I do that. So okay. as long as it's cut into like bite-sized pieces and, you know, a bonus is for him to pick it up with a toothpick, that's even, that's even better. But like, I can't, it's unrealistic for us to keep feeding him soup. I need to get from soup to like drier food. Right. Um, so you could even try doing, this is kind of a take on food chaining. It's not exactly food chaining, but going from even that, like the really, really moist texture of chicken to drier and drier. Um, so you can try starting with it, like encouraging the amount, you know, the lesser chewing and counting down with chewing when it's very moist, like when it's in a chicken soup or something. Um, and then slowly taking it out of the soup. So even like, even if you had chicken that would have been cooked in a slow cooker, that's, you know, a little bit softer, um, or in a sauce, that's a little bit, again, that's more of that soupy soft texture. Um, and then moving more towards that dry chicken, it, if that behavioral strategy does work of sort of counting down the chews. Um, so moving from moist until more dry, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cause he, so he doesn't do as many, like he doesn't hold it in his mouth for as long if it's like a chicken out of a soup. Oh yeah. No chicken out of soup. He eats it much faster. Okay. So yeah, so it is, it's more that dry. So he's really needing, it sounds like he's just needing a lot of fluid, like kind of what you said, like even eating the, the liquid to help him swallow. That's, 
it's tough to say. Like it could, it's it's possible that it's a it's a combination of sort of the, those oral motor skills plus just a preference of having something that's more moist um, combined with you know anything else, any of his anxieties or sensitivities around the meal itself, right? Um, but yeah, so I would try kind of if you can going drier and drier. Okay like starting from those soupy textures and starting with the strategies with the soupy textures so that he's successful, right? So that he feels like those countdowns work when he is doing something that he's already quite successful with. Um, and then slowly taking out that moisture. I see. Okay. And even offering sauces, I'm sure you've done this, Alina, but offering dips or other things that would add that moisture to the meat. Yeah, that hasn't worked for us at all. No, yeah, and it's funny. Some kids' dips are like a winner, and then some kids are just <laughs> it's a it's a no go. But I I will say I'll notice with a child they'll eat a burger in made in one way if it's moist, and if it's too dry they won't eat it. So part of that is just like preference. Um, and I know it's frustrating because you don't want to make everything in a soup all the time, but uh, but yeah, to to Julia's point, just try kind of weaning it off um, in small amounts. Have you tried giving him like a, even just broth to dip his chicken in or like other, cause if dips aren't working, it might be cause you said he doesn't, he's not a big fan of big, of big tastes, right? So even having like a chicken or vegetable broth for him to dip his chicken into? No, actually I have not tried that. Okay. Just, I thought just, I would, I would still try going kind of from moist to dry. Um, but then giving him the option even like, cause that's not so hard to keep you know, uh, if, even if you had like a carton of, um, the chicken broth, that's like the ready-made low sodium chicken broth in your fridge or whatever. And that, that way you can just kind of pour him a little dish of it and have it there just as an option for him to moisten his own chicken. Then it's not so much work for you. If you're giving, if you, you know, whatever, if you're the chicken you're serving, isn't completely moist, um, but gives him that option without adding much taste. Oh yeah. You know what? I'll try that. Cause what I do is I cut up vegetables. I never mash like smush anything because he doesn't like puree what i do is i'll usually cut up or grate vegetables so there's vegetables they're just cooked down really well mm -hmm. so i'll try maybe cooking them less and then have the broth on the side yeah then just take you know dip the toothpicks in and do that and maybe we'll go from there for sure yeah if you're already doing that then that's perfect and then and then you've got then you're dipping in a broth even that has some nice nutritional content too if it's the kind of the broth from steaming broccoli or from steaming you know whatever vegetables you're steaming that would be a great option mm -hmm. okay i that's that's definitely a good idea i'll try that how does he do with vegetables uh it depends like as, if they're in the soup and he can't really tell them apart like soup has been like our savior um he's okay with it he'll eat pieces of He'll eat pieces of green beans. He'll eat like pieces of carrots, you know, beets. I cook down like yellow beets because red beets usually, you know, make the broth color suspicious. But if I do like yellow beets or broccoli or even cauliflower in little pieces, you know, or sometimes I'll mix up the cauliflower rice with the regular rice. So, and add a little bit of broth to it and some meat, like, so he's okay. It just, it, it takes forever. Like the drier it is, the right. longer it takes for him to eat. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. The good news is he's got a good repertoire. Like I know it's a pain. I actually have another client that's going through something very similar. Um, a two year old, but, uh, but at least he's got a good repertoire. Like, he sounds like he's eating a variety of foods So nutritionally it's good. It's just requiring, it's more work on your part at this point. Um, and it's just nailing yeah. down like without, with some of those winning strategies are going to be, and it will take time to even, I mean, it might not work the first time or the fifth time, but, um, yeah, especially if he's a more sensitive child, getting him to adjust to change. But hopefully some yeah. of these things will help you. And the thing is, is that at school, he won't even eat, like, if anything has a sauce on it. Like, other kids love stuff in tomato sauce. No way. He won't touch. He won't eat chili. He won't eat anything, like, that, that has sauce. I think the only thing that he will semi-eat with sauce is if I make a lentil, like, chicken soup. <laughs> but it's, like, cooked down lentils. So it's like a lentil soup and then I pour that over a grain like rice or buckwheat. That would be the only thing that I think he would eat that's, you know, saucy. That's it. And that's like that is very that's like that's not uncommon. That that could be just a preference. 
right? Like I, you know, some kids like sauces, some kids don't, some kids like it. Sauces often come with a lot of flavors. So if he is somebody who likes blander food and that might not, that's not necessarily a, a sensory concern, right? It might just be a preference. Um, yeah. But definitely like I have, pardon me? I think you're right. Yeah. It's about the fact that it's bland. Yeah. So. And tomato sauce actually has flavor and acidity to it. Yeah. Absolutely. And tomato sauce tends to have a lot of flavor. Like I have, I have a two year old and I have a 17 month old and the two year old hates anything with sauce on it. I can't give her any kind of sauce. Um, so definitely I think it's like that could just be a typical uh, preference for sure. I see. I, okay. And what do you do with kids that don't want to sit at the table? <laughs> that, Again, that, it, it's for those different reasons, right? So it's hard to it's it's hard to give you a strategy when I'm not exactly sure what the reason is for him not wanting to sit. Um, if it's more around the frust like if it's more the frustration of the mealtime or anxiety about sitting at the table, um, or just you know you said he doesn't love to eat, right? Because he's not a big fan of food. Um, if that's more the concern, I would I would do the focus on the positive like the positive pieces and keeping it short. Uh, did you have something to say, Danielle? Uh, yeah, actually, well, yeah, similar just to build on what you said there, Julia. Um, the sitting at the table is an interesting one because we feel like, you know, it's proper manners to have our kids sit there, but they're not built to sit for long periods of time. <laughs> Definitely not for, you know, 45 minutes plus. So part of it, and there's some research now that's saying, or some experts in the world of pig eating and children's behaviors that are saying we shouldn't make our kids sit for a long period. So I'm still forming my opinion on the whole thing, but it's like a given that my kids will get up at dinner and they know the rules. And I, and so part of it is you just um, kind of figure out what you're comfortable with, but it is natural. Try like they're not going to do it forever, but it's, it's like you sit there on their bums, even when they're watching a movie sometimes or watching TV, like they can't sit still. So it, um, I think part of it is just being a child that they're active. I have a four year old as well. And oh my goodness, she got up from the table three times tonight, but that's just like, uh, that's part, you know, kind of par for the course at this age. And it's really just, I just decide, okay, this meal, you know, this is how it's going to go. We're, we're, we're not going to get up. And if you get up, it tells me you're full. And if you do it a couple times, then, okay, well, we take the food goes away. So you can decide what is comfortable for you. Um, for some parents, it's okay if their kids come back, grab a few bites and then leave. It's, it, it really depends, but it is tough for children to, to stay put. I don't know, Julia, if you would say the same or. The, the yeah. How, how long would you say he'll sit for at a time, Alina? So the thing is, is that he actually, we took him out of the high chair like about a month ago because we kind of said, you know, when he just turned four, we're going to take him out of the high chair. He can't sit in the high chair anymore. Like it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Also daycare has been blaming us. We've been saying that you keep him in the high chair and you know, like at here, he's at the table, so he has a really hard time sitting down and like learning table manners because you guys kind of did that to him. But he, he, if I were to put him back in the high chair, he will sit there. He'll sit there for half an hour. He'll sit there for 40 minutes. It's like his comfortable place. And the table, it's almost like the table gives him too much freedom. Like he doesn't know what to do with all that freedom because now he can get up and do this and then move from a chair to a chair. But like in the high chair, it was almost like it was comfortable. You, you know, it's, it's yeah. He, he liked the boundary of the high chair, right? It gave yeah. it like, clear. Like kids do like that, right? Kids like kind of a boundary. They like being given something that they that they understand, right? Um, so it might be a matter of giving him just another boundary. Like, how, do you give him a, an amount of time that he has to sit at the at the table, or like you know a certain that he has to eat a certain amount before he leaves, or any like do you give him any kind of boundary? Um, well, about definitely while everyone is sitting at the table, like us and his sisters, we're all eating at dinner. He's not allowed to get up and walk away. Okay. So that's a, that's a pretty clear boundary. <laughs> um, and how old are your other kids? Uh, so they're actually nine and 11. Okay. Um, so yeah. It's, I, you could try giving a, a different, like how long would you say he does sit at the table for at a time? Oh, well, I think after 10 minutes, he gets fidgety, but it's almost like it's, it's not a boundary that I tell him. It's like, it has to be somewhat like a physical boundary. Right. You know, like in a high chair, he has something to grab onto. Like he feels, maybe he feels secure. I don't know. That's why I'm wondering, is this a sensory thing? Does he like, sit just on a regular it, chair? Like, is it just a plain, like just a regular adult size chair that he's sitting on at the table? Yeah. Yeah. He is. He is. Do you and have, have Pardon me? 
And he hates boosters. He hates boosters. Okay, that was going to be my next thought is like even because maybe the high chair to just the regular chair was a big jump physically for him, right? Because now, and you know, in a high chair also there, there are some physical elements to it too, right? He's being physically supported by it. He's really um, stable in the high chair. The high chair is giving him a lot of stability. He's got, were you using a tray or was he just right at the table? Oh, no, no, he, he liked the tray. He, he didn't actually him. want to be at the table. Like he kind of, he felt like a king of his own castle. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, that's tricky because it does, it sounds like it, cause it, that's a, that's a big leap, right? Even a physical, like it's a big physical leap to go from, um, the security physically of having a high chair surrounding you and a tray in front of you to sitting at a table on a free chair. Um, what doesn't he like about booster chairs? I don't know. He just says, I'm not a baby anymore. Okay. And it, does he want to sit in the high chair? He, he does. That's the thing he does. I don't know, but I don't know, are we like harming him? Do we put him back in the high chair? Like he asks for it. He says, I want my high chair back so I can sit in it. Okay. It's tricky. Um, but, but he's four and he's going to school. Yeah. So. No, I hear you. It's, it's definitely a skill that has to sort of be generalized to other places, right? Um, and so at school, what happens? Is he junior kindergarten or is he going into junior kindergarten? He, he's going into junior kindergarten. And yeah. so right now he's at daycare. He is, yeah. And he has trouble sitting at the, like, um, they have small child size tables, so he has trouble sitting at those? Yeah, he, I mean, he's gotten much better with time, mm -hmm. because I think they've also told him, but yeah, he has, he has a bit of, like, he's fidgety, like, he, he'll right. jump, he'll jump on the chair, he'll move the chair, he'll rock the chair, he'll sit, but then he'll do everything to kind of, <laughs> like, you know, rebel against it. Is he very busy, not, you know, not related to feeding? Like, is he a pretty busy kid? He, yeah, I guess so. You could say that. Um, more so than your daughters were? No, not really. They're not also really. busy. Pardon me? No, like, I would say he's about the same. He, okay. In fact, he's actually better playing alone than they were. Okay. Um, you can try... Um, just to see if it would kind of help him get those sillies out before he sits down. But you can try having him do something that involves a little bit of physical work before he has to sit at the table. So um, does he ever help you set the table? Yes, I started to get him to do that. Yeah. Okay. So like we're in, in the efforts of getting, you know, this whole positive experience. I, you know, get him to chop things with his like baby knife and like, you know, he helps me pick out tomatoes. Like we tried to do all of that and he's very into it. But when it comes to actually eating, it's that's where it stops. Okay, that's all awesome. That that's really really good to have him involved in the meal prep and um, and all that piece too, for sure. For that positive aspect and really getting him involved, that's that's a great thing to do. Um, you can try having him do like a few, even if you do like a little warm up for sitting at the table. Like you know, we're gonna sit for a long time and it's hard to sit sometimes, and so we're gonna do a little warm up. And you can do something like um, ten jumping jacks, and you can do a few little wall push ups where they kind of you put. You, he puts his hands against the wall and tries to do like almost push the wall over five times, just getting a little bit of um, physical work into his body before he has to sit might help him to sit for a little bit longer. And then you can try giving that behavioral boundary again to see if that helps him. I would still keep it positive. So like I would encourage him, you know, if a timer is, if that's something that works for you, you can try um, setting a timer. And so if he's able to sit for 10 minutes, try 12 minutes um, just to keep it successful because you want him to be able to sort of successfully complete the goal you've set out for him so that he'll keep wanting to do it. Um, so you can try setting a boundary that's a little bit further than where he's able to make it and then like let him stand up and you know tell him okay come on back to the table and have a seat again and we're going to set your timer again. Um, or you can try using a different boundary. You can try using, um, trying to think, of not, just like if everybody, if the one of everybody, while everybody's sitting at the table is too much for him, you might just need to start from somewhere smaller and, and then build up to sitting for the whole meal, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Do you think that something like a timer would work or can you think of another boundary that, that, that might work better? No, I think a timer, I think a timer is a good idea. Okay. He, he does well with timers. Good. Okay. So then that's a good place to start if it's something that he already is familiar with and that, um, and that he enjoys. And you can, you can say like, you know, um, we're going to sit for as long as the timer is 
going and then when it beeps or when it dings, that's when you get to get up and you get a little break and encourage him to even like do something on his break. Tell him to jump up and down a few times and come on back to the table um, and kind of keep even a boundary around the break just so it's, it's a clear expectation. Okay, and if he chooses not to eat during the time that he's sitting there? So does he usually yeah. eat, when, so he prefers to eat when he's standing up? No, just, just in general. I, I mean, he doesn't prefer to eat in any way, shape, or form, but if, uh, unless he's fed. Um, but like, if he chooses not to eat, you know, in the, in the 10 minutes, then what do I, what do I do with them? I would bring him back, like I would keep bringing him back to the table. So it's kind of, you've got to, there's, there's sort of, a, yeah. No, no, no. My question was, he's sitting down, he's watching the timer. He's totally cool with the timer. Um, but he just chooses not to eat. Like, you know, he'll, he'll do other things. Like he'll look around, play with his pants. Like the other, you know, one day in daycare during a meal, he put his, uh, he put his finger into his pants and ripped a really huge hole. Like he kept doing that. Do you think that the timer would change? What, like, are you concerned that it would distract him from what he's already doing? No, it's more like, you know, I tell him you need to eat, you know, we were going to sit down and we're going to eat and we're going to sit and he'll just sit like he's okay. He will sit for as long as the time is, but he may not eat. So then what do I, what do I do after? Like he'll take two bites and that's it. But is that that's different than he would do like normally in sitting in that for that 10 minutes? I guess normally he doesn't really, normally he doesn't really have a time limit on it. So okay. Well, I think, because I think the biggest thing is, is because if you're saying it's taking, you know, a really long time, like if you're, if it's taking an hour plus for him to finish a meal, I would say that's where you want to start is deciding how long you're going to make the whole meal. Um, Pardon me? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering if to like, do I encourage him in those 10 minutes, you know, take more bites or let's do this or, you know, I guess if I keep on doing the chewing countdown, then it's not really an option. For him, yeah, because so, I'm going to keep him busy eating for those 10 minutes. Like, he's not going to be left alone, right? Like, I'm going to be actively participating in his meal and doing this together with him. Yes. And now you don't have to do it for every single bite he takes, right? Because that's going to be really hard for you. You're not going to be able to eat um, or focus on anything else if you're doing every single bite and you're doing countdown. So I would do it a couple of times in that 10 minutes um, and make it fun and encouraging, you know, tell him that we're going to try something new. You can even, if your other daughters will do it, have them do it with him too. Um, But don't, I wouldn't, you know, for that 10 minutes be sort of hounding him on, um, okay, we're going to take another bite. Okay. We're going to count down, you know, make it, a 10 minutes that wouldn't be all that different from what he would normally do at the table. Um, but show him those new strategies. So if you want to try the countdown, then, then, um, bring that in a couple of times for a couple of bites just to start. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll see. Yeah. Question. Cause he's, he's like, he, it's, it's so funny because I'll have to go and do stuff during the meal. Like, you know, it's, it's taking an hour and he's still eating. So I'll go and I'll start cleaning up and loading the dishwasher and I'll have one of my kids sit with him. So when I'm doing something, he'll turn to them and he'll be like, feed me. Okay. And so he wants to be fed with a utensil, like somebody putting food into his mouth? Yeah. Okay. And if I'm not around, then he'll ask his older sister to, to feed him. And do they? Yeah, they do, actually. Okay. So that, so he's, he's really – so and how does he do with utensils? Like how does he do with holding a spoon and holding a fork and all those things? He's okay, but I do think that maybe he gets either tired or bored with it. It depends on what he eats. If he eats macaroni and cheese, he has no issues holding or eating anything. Like hands, you know, <laughs> spoon, fork, all of it goes into full force. Yeah, so then I would say, like, the, again, just from a snapshot of what you're saying, it sounds more like it's just that behavior, right? He enjoys, he likes getting fed, he likes the interaction. Maybe he does get tired, because if he's sitting at the table for an hour plus, you know, that is pretty exhausting. Um, so it's possible he's getting tired, but it sounds a lot like, you know, if I ask my brother, or sorry, if I ask my sister to feed me, she'll do it. So I'm just going to keep asking. Um, so I would say, again, I would just set a boundary around it and say, okay, we're not like, we're not going to feed you. Like you, you, you you can eat your own food. You can use your own spoon or use your fingers. Um, but yeah, I would probably set a boundary around that if you think it's more of a behavioral strategy. Okay. So I'll definitely try it. Yeah. And I think, you know, after 10 minutes, you can get a little break and then he'll go back. And it might feel better, like, I'm just thinking for you, like, it might feel, it it might just feel better if you have a little bit of that, like, if you're having a say in it, right? So, like, it's, it's frustrating that he keeps getting up, but if you've decided together 
that he's going to get a break and it's a planned break, then it's a little bit less frustrating for you, right? Like as opposed to you constantly having to tell him like, no, sit back down, sit back down, sit back down. It's like, okay, no, we decided upon this break, even though he was still only sat for 10 minutes, we've agreed on it together and there's a, a boundary around it, if you know what I mean. So uh, just to kind of reduce that frustration around it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Danielle, do you want to do you want to move on to a couple of other questions? Or you yeah, so that's great. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thanks, Lena, for your questions. Let us know how it goes in the group. Uh, so I'm just pulling up the other ones here. So um, one of them was let's see here. I think was it Claire that had a question. Just trying to find it again. I clicked away. Um, okay, so we've got actually let's let's do here. Um, Let's do Hale. Okay, we'll do Kimberly. So she says, I've noticed that Luca uses his front teeth to bite and chew. Um, eating dried peas, for example, he puts them, uh, and he put them to his front teeth to crunch rather than the back. How do I encourage more back biting? So um, that piece, and then uh, I find Luca to be seeking many things on a uh, proprioception section of the questionnaire. What does that mean? And do I need to do anything differently? So on her questionnaire, actually I'll let you maybe speak to the front teeth and back teeth biting mm -hmm. um, while I pull up her um, questionnaire here. I know I read that one. I'm just trying to find it so I can reference it. Oh, I found it. Okay. Um, yeah, dried peas, putting them to the front of his teeth to crunch. So I would say um, if you if he's able to crunch with his back teeth, like if there's other things that he's not struggling with with the back teeth, um, that, that's one where I would encourage the um, – the toothpicks. Danielle, have you, did you, have you already talked about that strategy? Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause again, that helps just to get them a little bit further back. You can talk about the different teeth with them. So sometimes what I've done before with kids, if you have a toy or even a doll or a puppet where you can actually open their mouth, um, that sometimes is helpful even to describe to the child, depending on how old they are. So this is a child who would understand it a little bit more three or four older um, to, do you know how old Kimberly's child is? Yeah. He's almost two. Okay. So he's a little young. Um, okay. So in that case, so yeah, I, I would, I would use the toothpicks, um, for sure to get him just to put it, to put it further back in his mouth, or if you're maybe not a toothpick, but a little fork, um, or just something that's a little bit less sharp to put it further back in his mouth. Um, the other thing you can try is cheesecloth. So you can buy cheesecloth just from the, the grocery store. It's, it's that thin cloth that sort of, um, it's almost like a netting. And you can put food, if there's something he really likes, and something with a nice flavor, you can put something inside the cheesecloth so that, and then, and then encourage him to bite on it in the back. So you can put it on a stick, like a popsicle stick or something, just so that almost like a lollipop of some, of some sorts, um, so that he can put it in his mouth. He'll like the flavor and you can have him just practice chewing it. There's no concern. So sometimes when kids are really eating a lot with their front teeth, they're a little bit, they're, they're feeling worried about the food dispersing in their mouth. Um, so that's sometimes what happens or they haven't gotten used to using their tongue further back in their mouth. So giving him sort of just the practice without the food actually falling into his mouth. So the cheesecloth won't allow anything to, to go out into his mouth. It's really just giving him that kind of flavor. Um, but having him practice, it allows him to practice chewing with those back molars without the food dispersing into his mouth. So that's sort of a first step. Great. That's, yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, nice. I a lot of those baby food things that come in the, the mesh. Yeah. I yeah. I hate cleaning them, but yeah, <laughs> that would be a Yeah, it's a similar idea. I would just put it almost like a, attach it to a popsicle stick just so it can actually kind of, he's actually, because it's still those mesh things, you can still kind of chew on them at the front. Yeah. Or just something that would go where he can actually feel them at the back. You could still try using a puppet or something um, or a stuffed animal, anything where you can show him um, how, you know, the puppy eats with the back of his teeth or the, you know, whatever it is, a doll eats with the back of his, the back of their, their mouth and I get him to show you where that is. Um, you can use a mirror even yeah. so have him open up his mouth so he can see where the, where his teeth are and show him his front teeth show him his back teeth you can show him how you put food further back and are chewing with your back teeth um those kinds of visual strategies too sometimes help um especially if he's not not, not quite too because they don't they don't have a ton of awareness of of what's going on right yeah for sure that's great julia okay awesome so in terms of the proprioception stuff uh so basically okay. some of the things that she's um they were mostly there was no avoids it was pretty much all seeks um, with a few neutrals. Um, so what, one, 
yep. was rough housing, like activities such as rough housing, jumping, banging, pushing, bouncing, climbing, and other act- active play. That's kind of like a boy thing though. Like I feel like boys. it's also a two year old thing. Like I wouldn't, I, I'm not sure that's far out of the realm of what's typical for a two year old, like two or, or an almost two year old. Like that's, you know, almost two year olds are very physical, right? They need lots of climbing experience. Like they're, they're learning to use, like they're learning all those motor skills, right? So they're learning how to climb. They're learning how to jump, how to run, um, how to roll, like roll around and climb over things and roll over things. So, um, I'm not like it, when when kids are under two, it's actually really hard to judge whether something is actually a sensory concern or whether it's really just a developmental yeah. stage. Um, and even a little bit older than that, sometimes even in the three into the three year old, um, it's a little bit hard to judge whether there's anything sensory going on or if it's really just they're 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 going through their development. Um, because sure. sensory play, like that roughhousing play and that proprioceptive seeking is extremely typical for a two year old. Um and for an eighteen month like that eighteen month to two year range, that would be really typical behavior. Yeah. Um, being able to see him for sure, like that's not um doesn't jump out as a sensory concern. Yeah, and um for sure. And uh, I would say this child's um is definitely like your typical developmental child from from what I've seen, but the other two were eating crunchy foods um, or chewy foods and then smooth, creamy foods, which are both seeks. But again, that's, from my perspective, that's this typical child. Like they, most kids love crunchy foods and yogurt is often a favorite. (laughs) So, um, those are very different textures too, right? So if he really had a strong preference for crunchy foods, a lot of time you see like a preference for really like those really crunchy foods all the time. Um, and soft foods like yogurt, like creamy textures probably wouldn't be quite as enjoyable. So, um, yeah, I would say that's probably more of a preference. Okay, great. Um, and then, so that's Kimberly's. Then there was Haley. Uh, Haley says, because I have one more question, but I don't see another one here. So, okay, let's go with this one. So it may not, may not be sensory related. My child was diagnosed with low muscle tone. So basically everything in life is difficult for him. Could he prefer, uh, could he prefer certain textures and feelings because they're easy for him to handle or would any specific preferences and issues relating to that be exclusively sensory? So for instance, he likes, Say he likes blueberries because they're easier for him to chew, given that he doesn't have a robust tongue, mouth, throat, muscles. Um, or is it because he genuinely likes them? Then to consider meat, does he have a hard time with meat because it's a texture thing and sensory thing or because he generally doesn't like it? So, yeah. yeah. So sensory and oral motor, like they can be related, but mm-hmm. um, often they're also two separate things as well. So, uh, as you mentioned before, Julia, I don't know if, you, if there's anything you want to say about this, but I know like meat is definitely more difficult to manage from a, especially for a child who has low muscle tone versus blueberries. So that would be for sure would be my, um, assessment in terms of why he's, he's not wanting meat. Um, how, well, old? how old is this child? Do you know? Haley, uh, let me just, I'll tell you in a second. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you that it, especially if he's been diagnosed with low muscle tone, that means that that's all of his muscles. So that includes all the, you know, the muscles with his, around his jaw and his mouth. So those really um, kind of cumbersome textures are going to take him a lot more effort than would take somebody else. Um, so it, it could, it's, it's hard to tell, I guess. It's hard to say whether it's actually, you know, some, and it might be different for each food. So he might actually just really like blueberries um, and he might not be a huge meat lover. And, but it could also be that meat is quite challenging for him. Um, and then you might want to go for, you know, if it's, if you really think it's that they're challenging, then that's when I would go for the strategies of, you know, making meat softer and smaller pieces um, and those, the easier um you know, easier to chew and eat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely if, if he's been diagnosed with low muscle tone, I would say that there could definitely be some issues with the oral motor, the oral motor piece. Um, and a lot of it, it's just, you know, it's meeting him where he's at in terms of his skills and then slowly bringing him forward. So making it 
uh, you know, if, if it is that the meat is too challenging, it's a lot of what we talked about with Alina too. Like if the meat is too dry, then it's going to be a lot harder to chew. Um, so it's a matter of making it softer and starting with it softer and then slowly increasing it from there. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, just trying to, oh, here we go. Okay. So, um, Everett is 15 months, 13 months adjusted. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, you know, meat, depending on how many teeth he has too, right? If he's 15 months, he might not have all of his teeth. I don't, I, it depends on the kid. Some kids get all their teeth by then, others don't. Mm -hmm. Um, but that has an effect too on what he's able to chew and, and, um, and the textures that he's going to chew as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, a little muscle tone for it. Like again, because we experienced it personally and with some other families um, that I work with, it's, it definitely can it can lead to certain preferences for food. Mm -hmm. So I know at least my own avoided meat for the longest time um, until she got a handle. So it's like little things of like trying tiny pieces and making it helping them feel successful, as Julia was mentioning earlier. Um, they know they can handle the tiniest piece and maybe you can handle a little bit of a bigger piece and, and, and helping them move along that, that path. Uh, did we answer all the questions here? Um, I think that's it. Haley, I hope that helps. Let us know. And then Christy has a 20 month old and she says, our issue is that Taylor will not eat a single vegetable <laughs> except white or red potatoes and fries or nugget form. Um, not even sweet potatoes. We've tried sweet potato and carrots cut up like mixed fries, regular flies, and, oh, and she won't touch them. Um, and then as well from, a t from about 12 months, she won't eat any sort of meat or fish. She's had chicken nugget type dishes and only takes a couple of bites. Pretty much uh, nut butters and sometimes scrambled eggs and cheese are the only form of protein she will eat. So that's her thing. So it's again, typical, it seems like typical picky eater food preferences. Um, um, let's see here. Yeah. Not even like the sweet potatoes. I hear a lot where kids will eat fries, but not, not the orange fry. Both my kids. <laughs> Both your kids. Yeah. I won't yeah. eat. Yeah. Um, she says, I, I do make smoothies with veggies, fat and protein. It sometimes only takes a few sips. Uh, so yeah, that's it. And then she's just having, so, um, yeah, the veggie one is a tough one because part of it is just kids, like if they're super tasters, um, you know, that the flavor of veggie can be really um, over, can be overwhelming for them. It can be because they're more fibrous Um it can be, so uh, what'd she say here? She, so he only eats white or red potatoes in fried or nugget form. Um, so what do you typically, what do you typically suggest when this very general um, thing that we see a lot with, you know, kids, Julia, what would you, is there anything that you would, you would suggest in terms I of? I often suggest things like smoothies. Um, I suggest hiding vegetables. Like if you can making meals that where you would have purees and whatnot in them, like you can make sweet potato pancakes and, um, things like that. You can do a lot with avocados. Um, avocado is more of a fat, but, um, you can do a lot with like, with, uh, like if you mix all mush up avocados and bananas with a little bit of cocoa powder, you can make a pudding. So like, I often suggest kind of putting them in, in places like that. Um, but yeah, this, to me, this isn't for just from this description, it's not far off of that sort of typical picky eating. Um, I'm not sure there would necessarily be more going on from sort of a sensory oral motor piece. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So Christy, I think part of it is, it's the age, like this is the age where, um, they really want their independence and, um, well starting, I would say after a year is when the sets, they start to recognize that their own person and Hey, I don't have to eat this if I don't want to. And the more I know that mom and dad want me to eat it, I'm not going to vegetables are not as tasty as carbs and <laughs> the other foods. So there's a couple things that are happening here. And part of it is, I know it's frustrating to hear, but it's really just sticking to your guns and setting boundaries. And you know what, here's preferred food. You've got something that you like. There's always a new food trying different flavors, not trying to get, trying not to get stuck in the, um, that vicious cycle of only offering the foods that you know that they like. Um, 
And then just exposing foods in, in like away from mealtime. So doing more play with foods outside of meals, not making it about eating, using the sticker chart as I talked about in the um, last Q&A video. Actually, Julia, do you ever use sticker charts with your clients? Um, What's your perspective on them? We, I've used, um, like I, within the meal itself, I've used, um, not like I've used t um, token charts kind of thing, but uh, not specifically chicken, not, not specifically sticker charts. Okay. How are you using them exactly? Sorry, how? How are you using them exactly? Yeah, so it's more of just working up the hierarchy of um, the steps to eating. Okay, yeah. So, um, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that would be a great way to use it for sure. Yeah, so it's more about exploring the food. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I would say do those types of things. What else? Um, Definitely yeah. continued exposure, like, a, you know, keeping – keeping it visible to them too. Like even if, um, or on their plate, even if they're not going to try it. Um, but yeah, and definitely using the hierarchy is a great way to do it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And I, I find that when our, our goal is, you know, I need my child to eat this food. Mm -hmm. the, it like, it, doesn't happen. <laughs> it's kind of like we shoot ourselves in the foot because we're trying so hard. We don't realize we're trying so hard, but our kids do. And when independence is a factor, uh, the desire for independence, then um, depending on their personality, then they can resist even more so. So if we make it, if we try to bring food into like more of a play form, um, which I know you do a ton of Julia uh, with, so just, you know, whether it's like having to find um, I'm trying to think of like something um, in like a bag of rice, trying to find food in bag of rice or trying to make a necklace out of blueberries or um, green, like green peas, like count using them to count or playing soccer with them with your fingers, like yep. those things. I know we often don't want our kids to play with food, but it's actually one of the best ways to get them comfortable with the food from, yep. uh, from various perspectives. And then they realize, oh wait, this is, I don't actually have to eat this, but I might actually want to try it. Uh, so actually in phase four, you all received a cheat sheet with a number of ideas on, on things that you can do. And, uh, yeah. And if you're stuck on them, let me know and I can throw some more your way. But I would just say like part of this is just typical developmental um, behavior and they're going to come around as long as you stick with the protocol and you don't put the pressure on and make it super obvious that you really want them to eat because kids will do what you don't, what you will not do what you want them to do. And that's why, uh, you know, often I say to parents, like use reverse psychology once just to see what happens. So with my kids, I say like, this is make sure you, you know, we need to leave some for mommy and daddy. So don't eat all of the red peppers. And then they're both like clamoring. My one daughter doesn't even like red peppers and she just starts eating them. So it's like, you see that happening. Well, think about the opposite way. And we say, okay, come on, just have one, have a bite. Come on, just have a bite. They're going to be like, no, I'm going to do the opposite. So um, I know it's, again, it's not the answer that you're really looking for, but <laughs> that's, that's how I learned. I, I realized that the more, the harder I tried, the less success I had. Mm -hmm. And that's even with clients. Sometimes it's just taking a back seat and just being relaxed about it and just giving them opportunities to be successful in other ways. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add there, Julia. And then we do a lot of cheersing in my house. So like I have a very, very picky, almost three-year-old and she doesn't like her vegetables. But for some reason, if we do a cheers, yep. she'll eat more than if, uh, if we didn't. So we cheers our cucumbers or we cheers our tomatoes or I, and again, that's the idea of kind of using it in a fun way. Right. So not saying like, okay, eat another tomato, eat another tomato, say, okay, we're going to cheers our tomatoes. And sometimes she puts it in her mouth and sometimes she doesn't. Um, but again, it's taking that pressure off of take a bite, take a bite. And it's making something fun out of it. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um, so I think that's it. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Actually, Julie, can you just let people know where they can find you and how they can reach you if they do wish to have like, um, do you do like, there's a complimentary 15 minute call to determine whether it makes sense, like whether the child's a good fit to work with you or not, or just how that whole process works. I know there's definitely parents in the program that are starting to realize, okay, there's something else happening here. Sensory or, or, or motor is at play and they need a bit more, um, hands-on support. Mm -hmm. 
in addition to the pr protocol. Yep, so, absolutely. Um, can I post? Can I post information about that? Just so I yeah. can. Give, yeah. So I'll do it for sure. Um, but absolutely, I'd be I'd be happy to answer questions as best I could um, through through your your group and and whatnot. Um, and if somebody wanted to have a conversation, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, and just maybe just tell them what, you, what is your email address? Just, just rhyme it off now or your business so that they know where to find you and then you can also post it in the group. Yeah, for sure. So um, I am at, I'm Julia, uh, J-U-L-I-A at playfulstrides.com. So it's P-L-A-Y-F-U-L-S-T-R-I-D-E-S.com. So that's my work email address. Um, and I work for Playful Strides Therapy Incorporated. So um, definitely you can send me an email and I will post that in the group as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I can give you a phone number as well. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Julia. This is really yeah. helpful. Um, Alina, thanks for joining us. And um, I know a number of others wanted to join, but their kids were not going to bed and <laughs> had other issues. So um, hopefully you enjoy this replay and don't forget that we're in the group. And Alina, if you have anything else, let us know. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks. Have a good night, guys. We'll see you in the group. Okay. Thanks, Julia. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank you.